Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the WellBe podcast and show. This is your host, Adrian Nolan Smith, and I am thrilled to have Dr. Bill Rawls, an expert in treating chronic Lyme disease and other chronic health issues and diseases, specifically with natural therapies. Um, he is also a medical doctor, though, so he is uh, trained and able to use you know, conventional therapies, all of the above. And he wrote a fantastic book detailing Lyme disease and all the complications that come with it that I was able to read recently. Dr. Rawls, thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. You're so welcome. I'm, as I was saying to you before we started, so happy to have uh, an expert talk about this complex disease that has really affected my life, my family's life, your life, and millions of others, not just those who have actually been bitten and have gotten Lyme disease, but also their families, um, those who've been diagnosed, those who have not, those who have suffered just a little bit, those who have suffered for decades or a lifetime. It's a very, very uh, complicated problem and disease. And I think at one point or another, it's going to affect everyone, um, certainly in America, in some way or another. As I said, whether they get it or somebody they know is affected by it. So I think it's something that we can all learn a lot from. And I love that you also focus on other chronic diseases because it really is about how you can best equip your body to overcome something or anything. So I say, you know, for anybody listening that doesn't feel like they have a connection to Lyme or maybe you're in an area where Lyme is a low risk, I still think everything that you wrote about in your book and everything we will talk about today is really about healing anything, enabling your body to be its strongest and heal itself. That's what it's all about. No doubt about it. Okay, so let's get into it. I know that you have had your own history with Lyme that really changed the course of your medical practice. Would you mind sharing it? I see chronic Lyme disease, I guess, a little bit differently than a lot of people. And to me, you know, we, we look out there at chronic illnesses and there are thousands upon thousands of different chronic illnesses, but when you look at the symptoms, they all tend to merge together. And when, so that concept of diagnosis that we use to determine therapy is often a little bit artificial. So in my practice, I move toward looking at, well, what's the causes of illness? So I was practicing obstetrics and gynecology, I had been for about 20 years, and gradually my health deteriorated. Um, looking back, though, I wasn't taking care of my health. You know, I was stressed, I was eating on the run, and I didn't get any sleep. I was only sleeping every second or third night because of the, all the call. And so as I was approaching 50, everything collapsed. Um, ultimately, I found the microbes in my system that were carrying Lyme disease, but I probably had them my whole life, or a good portion of it, because I spent so much time in the woods when I was a kid. But it wasn't the microbes that made me ill. It was all these other things coming together. And when I talk to people, that's what I find so often. You know, people have this perfect storm of factors that come together in their lives. And so I see chronic Lyme disease differently than most people or Lyme disease. So I like to write up at the front, talk about the difference in acute Lyme disease and chronic Lyme disease because I think it's really important, and this is something that most people don't recognize. Acute Lyme disease is the introduction of that microbe when it comes into your system. You get a tick bite, the microbe enters your system, and, and there's an acute tug of war between your immune system and the microbe because you've never seen it before. And typically, either the immune system wins or the microbe wins, and you reach a, a solution um, but often with Lyme disease, these microbes are very stealthy. You know, they're not like COVID that have that break down the door front entry approach. They slide into your system and they can be there for years and years. So what happens with chronic Lyme disease is people have microbes, but their immune system becomes disrupted for whatever reason. So they become chronically ill. So it's not just the microbes that are contributing. It's uh, often 
years of stress, trauma, bad food, for me, not sleeping at night, and all those things come together to create that environment that allows the microbes in the body to thrive. That's what chronic Lyme disease is, and it's really fundamentally, I see it as, as most chronic illnesses. So when you look at fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, any of these illnesses, they basically seem very much the same. All the symptoms are the same. Um, but and when you look at any chronic illness, that fundamental feature of chronic immune dysfunction is present in every chronic illness. So I think whatever illness we're talking about, the immune system is central to that. Variations depend on how those factors come together to disrupt the immune system, the microbes that, have, that people have, because we all pick up stuff. We're all carrying things. And uh, it was this journey on chronic Lyme disease that helped me understand really how far that thing goes. So you talked about the difference between chronic Lyme disease and acute Lyme disease, which is obviously this prolonged, weak response from your immune system, right? Because of these other factors that you're talking about um, against the microbe, which allows it to thrive. But also within the acute Lyme, you see people that it doesn't really affect them that much. And then you see others where it is completely crippling and they are you know, basically bedridden and can't function. And it's so fascinating to me how people can have such different responses to Lyme. Can you explain a little bit more about why that happens? It's partly by chance and partly uh, other factors that are involved in affecting the immune system. So when you get a tick bite, you know, everybody has this idea that, well, either a tick is carrying Lyme disease or that tick is okay that tick bite is fine. And what I can tell you is ticks carry hundreds of microbes and many of them have the potential to cause illness. So I think often what's happening when someone gets sick initially from the tick bite is actually that they're picking up other microbes, some that may be more virulent or have a higher potential to cause illness than Borrelia. But it happens, you know, it has to do with the uh, person's immune system and their age. You know, younger people and older people tend to be more affected than those of us in the middle. So there are a lot of factors that go into play, but we look at it from those initial cases in Lyme, Connecticut. You know, when uh, Dr. Bergdorfer, who was, he was the person that the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi was named after um, as the causative agent of Lyme disease, and if you look back at his writings, the only thing that he really said absolutely was that the Borrelia microbe he was sure was the cause of the EM rash, the bullseye rash, but physicians have been reporting that for hundreds of years before those cases in Connecticut. But the people in Connecticut got sick rather acutely. And he also, in most of the specimens, found a species of rickettsia. It's a relative of the, the microbe that causes uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and it's, it's prevalent in the New England area. You know, I'm thinking, and he was thinking toward the end of his career, that maybe it wasn't just Borrelia. You know, it could have been another microbe, too. So it depends on the strain of microbes. You know, every strain of Borrelia is a little bit different. Um, there's so many factors that enter into the equation of whether someone gets acutely ill or not. Um, but I think there are an awful lot of people that are carrying this microbe who aren't sick. And that makes it really difficult to define. Yes. My own husband has been going back and forth for a couple of years about whether he has Lyme disease or not. And it's obvious that he does because, or it's in his system from a lifetime of playing in the woods in New England and taking the Igenix test, which is a better Lyme test, right? Um, and having his IgG, which we'll get into in a second, band show, you know, enough Lyme exposure there. Okay, so when was he bitten? How much has this actually affected him? How does he feel? And, and it's like after that, you just, it can get very confusing very quickly. But before we get into a lot of the details, you mentioned that Lyme is linked to other chronic illnesses. 
in your book. Can you talk about which ones and, and what, if there are any particular illnesses that you've seen make Lyme symptoms worse if people have them already? Yeah. Um, now we talk about how far down the rabbit hole we go. You know, when you look at this idea of, of Lyme disease, what I came, became acquainted with is the concept of intracellular bacteria. The Lyme microbes have the capacity to uh, inject themselves and live inside cells. And it's a pretty easy living situation for microbes, you know. It's, uh, if they can get inside the cell and take over the cell, they get free meals, they get all the resources they need right there. And they can just keep doing what they do, which is reproduce. Um, so I sat down uh, about a year ago and looked through the literature to see how many species of microbes that I could find that were intracellular had the capacity to infect people without causing symptoms, but could infect people and cause chronic illness if immune system functions were, dis were disrupted and could cause symptoms like Lyme disease. I came up with well over 100 different intracellular microbes, and that's just scratching the surface. And we had this idea that our microbes, as far as the normal microbes in our body, are isolated to our gut and our skin. And that just turns out to be uh, a, a really uh, superficial way of looking at it, that it turns out that all of our tissues, we have intracellular microbes. Um, I've found studies associating intracellular microbes. We found them in the blood, in the brain. The brain actually has a microbiome of its own, in the heart, in tissues, in joints. Um, and many of them can be pathogens, but many of them we carry. We pick them up from not only tick bites, from dogs and fleas and respiratory infections when we're kids and on and on and on, um, to the point that the latest study that I pulled uh, several days ago was the finding of uh, the microbiome of different kinds of tumors, breast all kinds of tumors that have intracellular microbes that live in the tumors. Now this study, they didn't cause cause and effect, but I actually found another study where they had experimentally in induced cancer using intracellular microbes. 20% of cancers are associated with intracellular microbes. So this is big. So when you look at the connections, um, the other microbes out there that we talk about associated with Lyme, Bar Bartonella, Mycoplasma, Rickettsia, Leukia, all of these kinds of things, Chlamydia, they've been associated with multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autoimmune illnesses, on and on and on. And so that really has me thinking about, well, you know, how far do these associations go? And you look at that fundamental thing of all chronic illnesses have chronic immune dysfunction. And you look at what's the motive of the microbes, you know, what these microbes want from us. And basically they want nutrients. We are their food. And if it weren't for our immune system, they would break down our tissues very rapidly. Our cells have restricted growth. In other words, they have to stay within parameters of an organ system like a heart or the brain or joints or, or liver. You know, you can only have so many cells and when things, when our cells break out of that and start growing in an unrestricted fashion, that's what cancer is. Bacteria, their only reason to exist is to grow. Their growth is completely unrestricted. So as long as there's a food supply, bacteria keep growing. So when you look at the microbes in your body that inhabit not only gut, your gut, skin, but all through tissues in your body, the only thing, the only thing that holds them back is your immune system. So if your immune system isn't working, these things start flourishing in all of our tissues and they wreak havoc. Because everybody's microbiome is different, 
and because our immune systems are different and because the stress factors that we become exposed to are different, you end up with different illnesses. Wow. Okay. So that, I mean, that explains a lot about why it affects certain people differently because we all have trillions of different microbes within us at any given time, right? So if two kids get bitten on the same day in the same place and they're the same age, they're going to have very different experiences. What would you say are the biggest, you know, some other of these biggest myths and misperceptions surrounding Lyme? You know, there's a lot of them, but what would you say in all of your research? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of them. The biggest one is that chronic Lyme disease doesn't exist. You know, so many conventional physicians, it's uh, Borrelia is a recognized bacteria. You get bitten by a tick and this microbe enters your system and it makes you sick and you get antibiotics and then you're well. And it's, it's such a huge misconception because we know that a lot of people who get antibiotics, it doesn't clear the microbe. I've seen too many people that had a tick bite, got antibiotics, and showed up with symptoms on a positive test years and years later. Uh, so these things, you know, we, we don't eradicate them very well with microbes. Not to say that we shouldn't be treating people with acute Lyme disease. You know, what we're doing there is knocking down the microbes enough that it helps the immune system get a better grasp of that situation. So I do advocate my antibiotics for acute Lyme disease. But fundamentally, the difference... Real quick, just so that people can be sure who are watching, can you explain your definition of acute just your, you know, time frame kind of a thing? Acute, uh, yeah, acute Lyme disease is someone that gets bitten by a tick and within weeks or at the latest a couple of months, they start having symptoms. Okay. Um, usually okay. within a couple of weeks, they're going to have symptoms. And that can be anything from stiff neck, mild fever, aches and pains. But if you didn't know that you had the tick bite, which happens all too often, it would seem like just a mild viral illness. You wouldn't uh, you wouldn't think that you had Lyme disease. Yeah, most people, I think, don't don't really see the bite. No, um, it's it's pretty unusual, actually. Most of the people that I talked to uh, had didn't recognize the tick bite and didn't get antibiotics in the beginning. Yeah, because I think we're all not really in our bodies that much anymore, you know. So yeah. to really pay attention to something like feeling a little more tired or sluggish or a very mild fever, people might not even take their temperature. I think, unfortunately, COVID has helped us to pay closer attention to how we're feeling so that, you know, things don't get out of hand. But there's a small window of opportunity between when something switches from acute Lyme to chronic Lyme and paying attention is really that difference. But anyway, please continue with your answer to uh, the biggest misconceptions and myths around Lyme, I would agree that there very much is chronic Lyme as the most important misconception or myth, um, but I'd love to hear if you have any others. Yeah, that, that's a big one. And, and for those you know, physicians who recognize chronic Lyme disease, um, fortunately, they're getting away from it, but you know that, that the answer to chronic Lyme disease is pounding someone with antibiotics for six months to a year which can work, but usually doesn't work. It's so important to distinguish between acute and chronic. You know, what we're talking about here that's really important to recognize is that difference in immune function. So someone with acute Lyme disease uh, may have perfectly normal uh, immune function and it won't become chronic if they have normal immune function. Uh, whereas chronic Lyme disease, by definition, is a dysfunctional immune system. Um, so that's another myth, I would say, that's out there, is that uh, antibiotics eradicate microbes from the body. Um, that happens zero amounts of the time. And, and this is a big misconception. Um, when we use antibiotics, in any case, basically what we're doing is we're helping out the immune system. And I think this is important to recognize. You know, if you take someone like an elderly person or a person with AIDS, that their immune system is shot and they develop an acute bacterial pneumonia, you can give them all the antibiotics on earth and they will still die. 
Um, if they don't have an, a, an intact immune system, the antibiotics are not going to eradicate the microbes from the body. So it's very important to recognize that everything we do that, that helps us to become well again has to do with supporting our immune system. And sometimes, especially with a, an acute infection, that can be antibiotic therapy. But the antibiotics simply knock the numbers down and allow the immune system to do its job. And the irony, I think, that a lot of people don't realize, and I'll just chime in as this is part of what you just said, but because antibiotics wipe out a lot of your good gut bacteria and therefore um, compromise your immunity because, you know, I think it's 70% of the immune cells live in the gut. It makes it actually potentially harder, right, for your immune system after a course of antibiotics to get up all of its strength to go fight something, right? Oh, no, no doubt. I, I've even read that a 10-day course of antibiotic dis severely disrupts certain parts of your intestinal flora. Um, so, yeah, any antibiotic therapy is going to adversely affect the flora in your body. And I always see it as a race, you know, um, with the antibiotics. Can you knock down the numbers of the pathogens before you destroy your normal flora, which messes up your immune system, which is going to cause you to lose the race? So all antibiotics, um, there's a time limit on that as far as conventional antibiotic therapies. Right. That makes sense. I like that analogy of the race. I haven't heard that before. So we've talked about a lot of these major myths and misconceptions. And I think most people that are watching this and are in my community recognize that chronic Lyme exists um, from a lot of the stories that I've told and things that I've gone through myself. But there's, a, I think, a still a lot of confusion around the, okay, acute versus chronic and I, you know, I go to my doctor and they still tell me antibiotics is the first course of action. So, you know, what do I do? And also there's a ton of questions around testing. And I have got friends coming to me constantly when they find a tick on their child and, you know, on themselves saying, where do I send this? Sure. What's the best test? And since you are the expert, not me, I would love for you to say, you know, kind of, the latest on you know what we what you would do if you found a tick on you tomorrow. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, as I said in the beginning, um, my salvation and my recovery, I used herbal therapy. So I think that's a really important mainstay. But I think you, you know, sometimes people look at herbs and look at drugs as these are things that we substitute one for another and they really act totally different. So there's a place for antibiotic therapy and a place for herbal therapy. And, you know, so when you're talking about herbs, you're talking about uh, the full spectrum of the chemicals being produced by the plants because plants are protecting themselves against a range of different kinds of microbes. You know, we have a cellular immune system whereas plants have a biochemical immune system. So they are producing a wide range of chemical substances, not only to affect bacteria, but to also to affect vir viruses, yeast, protozoa, the full range of microbes. And so it's, uh, it's not as potent as an antibiotic. Like if somebody comes in with an acute pneumonia, I'm going to treat them with an antibiotic because the, the, the herbs aren't going to get them where I need them to be fast enough. But when you look at a situation where you have someone that has a chronic illness that their immune system isn't functioning well, they've got not just one microbe in their body like an acute pneumonia, but everything, all the microbes in their tissues are starting to thrive because the immune system just can't keep a lid on it anymore. So you need this chronic suppressive therapy to knock that thing down, not for a week or two, but months and sometimes even years. In fact, I took herbal therapy for uh, in pretty intense antimicrobial herbs for more than five years which really it's hard for physicians to get their head around that because we're used to fast acting antibiotics, but the herbs are acting differently. And because the herbs don't affect normal flora, 
you can do it long term. So it's one of those things that works out in nature. You know, the plant can't produce things that are going to kill off the things that are favorable, that are helping it. Um, it wants to kill off the potential pathogens. So there are a lot of herbs that have pretty strong antimicrobial properties. And, uh, and these are the herbs that we typically use in Lyme disease. So they definitely have a place. Um, it is quickly uh, becoming apparent that chronic herbal therapy for chronic Lyme is probably the best thing that you can do for it. And that's being supported by not only thousands and thousands of people that have been using it, but also uh, recently Johns Hopkins produced a study that they took some of the herbs that I recommend and uh, found that they were actually more effective in suppressing Borrelia than antibiotics were. Yes, um, we do a research and health news wrap up every other month. And I went to Johns Hopkins actually for college. So I, I covered that study in my wrap up because I thought it was so cool. And just a combination of things in my life, you know, where I went to college, this Lyme disease I had. And then of course yeah. I used herbal therapy as one of the therapies that helped me to recover. So it was um, kind of cool. But staying on that topic, you mention a number of different natural therapies that could be or you know have been depending on the person effective at treating chronic Lyme in addition to herbal therapy you know I, I don't want to detail all of them there there are many different ones so anybody who wants to look those up can certainly grab a copy of your book but would you just say besides herbal therapy in your practice or just generally from your knowledge of this disease what are the couple most promising out there right now um, well, er herbs are my foundation, there's no doubt about it, and they're different kinds of herbs. So when you look at plants, what kind of chemicals they produce, that spectrum of phytochemistry that comes with the plant depends on where the plant is grown and where it evolved. So like rhodiola is an adaptogen that helps us deal with stress and it comes from northern latitudes where the environment is very, very harsh but there aren't very many microbes there, so it's not as good an antimicrobial. Cat's claw comes from the Amazon where, yeah, there are a lot of microbes in that hot, moist environment, and it's a really nice antimicrobial. So you have a lot of range within the herbs, but beyond the herbs, um, there are some nutrients that I think are very important, like glutathione, NAC, uh, various kinds of nutrients, some of your B vitamins are. Which, which I should add was just a story in the New York Post. Um, did you see that woman whose son, she was on a resp respirator near death from COVID and her son brought glutamine. So it was like glutathione and NAC to help and she survived. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I've read about that and it doesn't surprise me um, I uh, had conversations years ago when we were looking for a brand of uh, glutathione that I, I met a physician who I'm not sure ever published in the study, but he had a collection of teenage kids with cystic fibrosis that he was using glutathione because it has the effect of reducing mucus in the lungs and reducing inflammation, but also has some antiviral effects and they were living normal lives. But you know, you have to do your part to a uh, good healthy diet, stress reduction, getting plenty of sleep. All of those things have to be part of that uh, protocol of restoring your immune system. So I noticed that in your book when I was reading the kind of roadmap for getting better, it looked like just a roadmap for living a healthy life, more or less. I mean, the, the importance of diet, the importance of restoring a healthy gut, the importance of sleep, stress management, these essential nutrients that you were just talking about, whether they can you know, all come from your food or your sunlight or whether you need to supplement a bit, all of that was so, you know, like, of course, of course that sure. makes sense. But I want to ask just one other question about some of the more specific natural therapies that you mentioned, because I get a lot of questions about this. And when I was going through my, my chronic Lyme treatment, um, as I said, I used herbal therapy and some energy medicine. And I should say the herbal therapy that I used was through Chinese herbal teas. 
and some supplements. So when you talk about herbal therapy, are you talking about mostly in capsule form or tea form or, you know, how do people experience that? Any way that I can get it in there. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. There are a lot of different preparations out there as far as getting these, what I call phytochemicals or phytonutrients in a person's body. And we want to get it as concentrated as we can. So a tea is going to pull out just purely the aqueous based chemicals. And you got a lot of good stuff in there. But if you do a water alcohol tincture, you're also going to pull some of the fat soluble agents out too. So you get a little bit wider spectrum. So that's a difference in a tea that you would steep and drink and, and a tincture. So a tincture, an alcohol, water alcohol tincture is going to be more concentrated and it's going to have a greater or wider robust concentration of the phytonutrients or the phytochemicals. Um, but the thing about a lot of these things, and, and the thing about the teas too, is many of these, these phytochemicals are really bitter, and they're just not something that most people would find palatable. So it's hard to get teas or even sometimes alcohol tinctures in them. Um, so I tend to lean more toward the capsules. Um, again, there's no wrong answer here, and I use a variety of different things. But the capsules offer an opportunity to get really intense phytochemistry in someone without having to take large amounts of, of tinctures or water in the form of teas. So there are two different ways you can get capsules. You can get the whole herb that they basically just dry the herb, crush it up into a powder and put it in a capsule. And quite frankly, that's going to be your less expensive capsules. And basically, you're getting a bunch of fiber more than anything else. Not much phytochemistry in there. But what we're using is standardized extracts. So a standardized extract, what they're doing is basically taking that water alcohol tincture that has really concentrated phytochemicals in it, spraying it onto a surface, drying off the water and alcohol, and collecting that powder and putting it into capsule form. So you can imagine how concentrated that is. It's got a lot of power to it. So I found over time that that's the thing that I can consistently get in the most people to get the amount of phytochemistry to actually do them some good. I tried most anything that I could try and um, at the time that I was going through this, I, uh, had, I had to leave the obstetrics and gynecology practice that I was in because I couldn't take call anymore. Um, didn't really have a diagnosis to declare disability. So I started a medical practice. And so I was practicing and trying to figure things out and get myself well. So I was stuck with a practice. I couldn't really leave town. Um, it was a big financial burden, so I really didn't have the option of pursuing a lot of uh, integrative type procedures. I couldn't go and see integrative doctors. There weren't any in my area. So ozone and um, hyperbaric oxygen were not things were, that were really at my disposal. Um, I had to use them in my practice, though, to help a couple of times I had patients that had, uh, you know, poor, poor tissues and weren't healing from surgeries, and I had used hyperbaric oxygen with really good results. Uh, so there are definitely applications for it. When I look at therapies, I look at three variables, and I did this through my entire course of recovery, and I, and I still think it's really important as a guideline to think about. Um, so the three indicators that I looked at were efficacy, does this thing work, or the, you know, can we find some evidence that it does work, safety, what's the potential toxicity with this thing, and the third was cost. And so those three variables were what I used to guide my therapy. Um, cost was a big issue with me and, and availability. So many things, you know, I, I had to do what I could bring to me. So at that point, you know, the herbal therapy, thousands of people had been using it. Uh, Stephen Booner published a protocol around that time. So thousands of people had gotten benefit. 
the safety factor with herbs was very, very high, and the cost relative to most things was, was the most cost effective. So that was kind of my gold standard to comp compare everything else to. You know, I, I looked at but didn't use turpentine. Uh, there's something called a miracle mineral solution that's basically uh, bleach that people are doing in low doses. I mean, I, <laughs> I evaluated everything. Colostrum, I did try. I didn't at my point in time feel like I was getting as much from it as the herbs so that I abandoned it because I didn't notice a difference. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have value and it may have been to get the products that I was getting. So there may be better ways to take it. Um, so ozone and hyperbaric, along with many other things, I put in the category of heroic therapies. In other words, um, there may be some efficacy there, but the cost is usually pretty high. You know, hyperbaric oxygen, uh, ozone therapy, hyperthermia that people will have to travel to Germany or other places. So cost and toxicity are really high with those things. Um, and the efficacy is pretty good, but it's not as well studied as some things. So I think where to put those things is how you use them exactly. And that is build your foundation, you know, change your diet, change your sleep routines, make sure you're doing everything that you can do to help yourself. Use the herbal therapy. I mean, that's part of that foundation. And then if you're doing well with that, but you want to go a little bit faster, you know, you want to knock out the microbes more and stimulate the immune system and just give yourself a boost, that's where ozone and hyperbaric fit in. Um, but the colostrum, homeopathic nosodes, there's so many things that can fit in that category of natural therapy that the potential for harm is really low, the cost is low, so it's kind of like, why not? You know, if you look at something and it's not costing you much and it's not going to hurt you, yeah, sure. But if you look at something and it's like, well, it's, I have to travel, it's going to be really expensive and it could make me really sick, that one put it on the table until you're a little bit stronger and you feel like you're better and then it's something to look at. So I think those are some reasonable guidelines to help people put things in perspective of how they pursue this. And it's not just for chronic Lyme disease. I think that goes for everything. But, but uh, the thing that I've seen so many Lyme sufferers do is they're jumping from one heroic therapy to another and they never get well. They never build that foundation. First it's ozone, then hyperbaric, then they're flying to Germany to get, uh, to get hyperthermia. And those things work for a while, but then they wear off and then it's off somewhere else. And before you know it, they're bankrupt. Right. So yeah, no, I, uh, I, I've seen all of that. It's uh, good to hear you talk about it in a reasonable way, because I think you can get really, there's sort of no limit to the number of different expensive, incredible treatments that can be done to try to not only kill the microbes, but, you know, give you this amazing immunity. Whereas there are things, like you said, that are right at your disposal, like herbs and sleep and your diet, and even stress management practices, all of that, that have an amazing impact before you need to go move to Switzerland yeah. for three months and do this kind of, you know, whatever it is. But I want to ask you about testing before we wrap, because um, I know that's something that people have so many questions about, and I wouldn't want to leave it undiscussed. If you got a Lyme bite tomorrow, so this would be acute Lyme, what would you do with the tick? Where would you send it? How would you remove it? Would you start on a course of antibiotics that day? Like walk us through what you would do. There's no right or wrong answer here. I think this is important to recognize. What I would do personally is I would start taking a boatload of herbs. And then if I got symptoms, I would add doxycycline probably wouldn't go to the expense of uh, sending the tick. And I probably wouldn't do any other testing unless I developed pretty severe symptoms that might indicate that I had something like Rocky Mountain spotted fever. There is more value in uh, testing for an acute tick bite, but the biggest reason I would want to be tested 
is if I continued having symptoms to make sure I didn't have Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which might suggest that I needed extra or prolonged doxycycline. But testing for acute Lyme disease for the, the, you know, the basic microbes we're looking for, rickettsia, anaplasma, borrelia, just the, you know, the normal ones that, um, the top ones that are most well known for causing illness is pretty good. But you, know, you have to recognize there are 12 species of borrelia worldwide that cause Lyme disease. And I think there are more than occur than we are looking at. Uh, there are dozens of species of rickettsia, anaplasma, and others, and we're finding that these are really common, a lot more common than people realize. So even acute testing has problems. But when you get into that question of well, what about chronic testing, then you're in a whole different situation because what happens is as you move into that chronic state where your immune system is dysfunctional, um, the microbes have suppressed the immune system. The microbes are in low concentrations, deep in tissues. Then take a high concentration of microbes into tissues to make you sick, and you don't have high concentrations in the bloodstream, so that it's really hard to get a positive test or a test that you can count on when you have in, in that chronic state. Um, and you know, once you move into that place, it's not just the original offending microbe or microbes, and then you've got all the microbes in your body flourishing. So it's not going to help you as much as you think. A lot of people put a lot of weight on it. You know, I've, I've said over and over that the biggest difference between fibromyalgia and chronic Lyme disease is a positive test. Um, there's so many people out there that think they have fibromyalgia that are actually carrying Borrelia and other microbes, but they have chronic immune dysfunction. Um, the symptoms overlap almost specifically with chronic Lyme. That being said, there are people out there with fibromyalgia that don't have Borrelia, but they've got other microbes that are flourishing and other things going on. So it does make things a bit complicated. Um, sometimes complicated beyond our capacity to make these firm targeted conclusions. I think it's also, you know, when someone's about to go fight a war against something, right? And in this case, it's this bacteria or maybe a collection of bacteria if it had, you know, the bite had co-infections. But you kind of want to feel like you know why you're doing it. You know, I think that's what the test is like, okay, I will take this seriously if I actually have Lyme, you know, or yeah. I, if I'm just kind of depressed and there's some aches and whatever, to, uh, am I really going to mount this huge offensive? Whereas if you get that test and it's positive and you know you're up against this, then you're like, okay, here we go. And it's easier to kind of, you know, gather all your strength for the fight. So uh, that's why I've always thought the test uh, was helpful for people. But the problem is, and please talk about this, is that when you get the testing back, because of how they do it with, you know, if it's three out of the five bands, you have this, and it's just, it's, it's kind of like very subjective. It's not a yes or no. So you get a test back so desperately wanting a concrete answer, and instead you have kind of this thing that's left up to interpretation, which is right. very frustrating. It is. And you said it right there. People are desperate because they have this conception that I've been infected with a microbe, the microbe is making me ill, and therefore if I can find out this, that, that this microbe is there and direct the correct targeted therapy at the microbe, I will be well. And it's another chronic Lyme myth. It just doesn't exist. You know, when you look at chronic Lyme disease, you know, an analogy would be the difference between fighting a war against a conventional army and fighting a war against terrorists, all right? So when you look at a conventional army, they're all out front, you know what you're dealing with, and two powers go at it, and it's very well defined. And civilians are, you know, you do it out on a battlefield. That's how traditional wars were fought. But now we've moved into uh, these terrorists that 
Uh, they live among people and you don't know where they are or how to go after them. And you end up killing a lot of people, innocent people, trying to route out the terrorists. That's what we're dealing with here. And, and so if you try to treat it like it's a conventional war, you're not going to win. And it's, uh, so you have to do things that are unconventional. You have to do things that route out these microbes without destroying your cells and your immune system and all your other normal flora in the process. That's one of those misconceptions that people have to get past if they're going to get well. All right. So if somebody has acute Lyme or has a bite and sees a bullseye and is like, okay, I really want to get a, a Lyme test, even just so that I can know if this is really just Borrelia or many other microbes and kind of what I'm dealing with, are there certain labs that you think are doing it better or certain approaches to this testing that you think are doing it better than others? That's a really hard one to answer. And yes, I think there are labs that really care about what, we're, what they're doing. We have a lab that specializes in Bartonella in Durham, North Carolina called Galaxy Lab that I've uh, you know, had correspondence with them quite a bit and met with those folks. Uh, everybody knows Igenix as a lab. You know, so, so these labs are out there and they can make a difference. Um, the, the thing about Borrelia is they're doing other bands that might pick up the, and, and here we're talking about antibodies specifically directed at parts of the microbe that might be uh, identifiable um, because there are a lot of Borrelias out there. You know, we all have species of Borrelia that live in our mouths. They're part of our normal flora. Uh, so it's not just these, uh, these microbes that are carried by ticks that the test can pick up. So the bands are different antibodies to different specific uh, parts of the microbe that might give us a clue as to whether it's there. Um, the better testing is DNA testing, but you have to have a fairly significant m amount of microbe to get it. So, you know, testing for antibodies to the microbe or testing for the DNA of the microbe, both of those are possibilities. The testing is getting better over time, um, but it's also very, very expensive. And there is a factor that I think you have to think about, and that is people are desperate. And what they want is a positive test. So there's a huge incentive for these companies that if you're paying $600 to $1,000, they want to give you what you want. So my question is, how much of what we're seeing are actually false positives? That they've set their indicators to give people what they want, which is a positive test. So what it boils down to is that if you have all the symptoms of chronic Lyme disease, which overlap with symptoms of fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue and multiple sclerosis and everything else. If you have all of those symptoms, then you have chronic immune dysfunction and you have pathogenic intercellular microbes in your body that are flourishing and they are further disrupting your immune system and causing a vicious cycle that are allowing all the microbes in your tissues to flourish and grow, and that is making you ill. And until you solve that problem, you're not going to get well. So what you have to ask is, where is that 600 to to $1,000, or in some cases, five to $10,000 worth of testing to chase all these different microbes? How much, how valuable is that? So, so many cases, you know, when, when people ask me that question, I say, save your money, invest it in that good foundation, herbs, good food, taking care of yourself, getting back what you've lost. And then if you're six months into it or a year into it, and you're not progressing progressively better, then start thinking about investing and testing to figure out, well, what's there that I'm not solving? But we've been trained to, we've got to find out what it is, and then we can treat it. 
and it just doesn't work with chronic illness. It's, it's a total dysfunction with our entire system. And when we look at chronic illness, we, we treat it very dysfunctionally in that instead of going, why is the person ill? We go, how do we treat them? And I think it's a huge mistake. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to think about it. All right, so I know we have to wrap up and I feel like I could probably interview you <laughs> once a week on Lyme disease because it is such a hot topic and growing at such a rapid rate around the country and around the world actually as well. But you know, we're, we're recording this in the summer, we're recording this in the summer of COVID. So, so many people are just concerned in general about their immune systems and, you know, potentially okay. being compromised. And the idea of having a Lyme situation on top of COVID, people are just, I think it's almost too much to handle. So a lot of people are nervous about going into the outdoors this summer. But, you know, I know how important nature therapy is, you know, and grounding and these other things that you've talked about in your book that I talk about and the blue ocean effect, I could go on and on. But what is your advice to people about, you know, protecting themselves against their risk, but also, you know, going out into the outdoors and what's the best thing for people to do this summer? I think it is a, it is a significant risk, but I, th I think people have to appreciate that we are living in the age of chronic immune dysfunction. You know, the food we're eating, the way we've affected our atmosphere with cars we're driving and all the things that we're doing to the atmosphere, um, how we go about life, everything is affecting us. These microbes have been around since the beginning of humans. We are seeing more Lyme disease and chronic Lyme disease and fibromyalgia and all these chronic illnesses because our immune systems are being disrupted so much. So I, I think that's a really important message to get out there is we need to change our approach to life and we need to change our atmosphere. You know, if you get National Geographic last month had a, a really frightening article that they basically showed the proof that our insect populations worldwide in 30 years have dropped by 80%. And that has to be what we're doing in our, to our environment. It's not just affecting the insects, it's affecting us too. Because we're um, also killing some of the ticks' natural predators, so well, they're flourishing. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, why are we seeing more ticks in New England? Well, there's some kind of disruption in, in the environment. It's not global warming. I mean, we're, we're not seeing the ticks down here in North Carolina that I've seen up in New England. And we've got a warm, moist, perfect environment. So I have to ask that question. But I'm still getting out there. You know, I was picking blueberries and blackberries yesterday. It's my favorite summertime thing. And, you know, that's, that's where the ticks are because they want to pick up a free, free ride and a free meal while you're picking berries. And it's the way it's always been. I'm hyper vigilant. I'm really, really careful. Um, I take a shower as soon as I come in. Um, if I'm going to be in brush, I use essential oils. Personally, I don't use DEET because it just lights me up and sets me on fire. It's a really potent chemical. I found that the essential oils work really well. I've also found over the years, though, that I've, as I've been taking herbal therapy more regularly, I don't seem to be quite as palatable to ticks and mosquitoes. They just, I don't get as many as I used to. Um, but, but it's just super hypervigilance. So I'm still out there, but I'm very, very careful about where I go. If a leaf brushes up against me, I look. If, uh, me if I feel something on my leg, I look. And, and in doing that, I've been able to get out into nature, which I think is really important. Um, one of the best things that you can do for your immune system is take a walk in a forest. It's been proven over and over and over again. So we still need to get out there. It's just that you have to be very vigilant. I agree with and appreciate, you know, all of those suggestions. And um, I think uh, for the most part, like anything, crossing the street, flying on an airplane, you know, whatever it is, it's things that have to do with COVID, there's a certain amount of risk and you have to understand your risk tolerance and also the risk reward, you know, never going into nature has a downside 
as well for your health. So there's a balance there. Let me ask you really quick, what is the essential oil that you put on in case anybody would like to grab some when you go out into nature? All of our essential oils are basically insecticides. So there's a variety, uh, eucalyptus, tea tree oil, lavender, all of them have some, some anti-insecticide properties or, or insecticide properties, uh, clove, uh, you know, virtually all of them. Um, but there are many good preparations on the market now. They work both for fleas and, and ticks. So you can get your own essential oils, um, but they have some really nice sprays that uh, feel good. And typically, if you choose a product, you know, there's some essential oils that can burn your skin like clove. So you have to be careful of them. Um, and most of those products are going to only include the essential oils that have some properties that are beneficial as far as protecting you from insects, but also aren't going to burn your skin. That's good to know. <laughs> um, yes, there are a couple that I know of that we will try to include in the article that are, yeah, like some nice, you know, tick specific essential oil sprays. So that's great. My very last question for you is, and I think I know part of this because you've already mentioned a few of the things, but how do you hashtag get wealthy. So this is something we ask every expert that comes on the show. And it's essentially what are your absolutely can't miss wellness practices that you do every single day for yourself, whether you're home or traveling or, you know, have a busy day or a slow day. It could be one thing, two things, three things, but when you miss them, you just know you're kind of headed in the bad direction. I get well be by first on the list is herbal therapy. I don't take as many antimicrobial herbs now because I'm essentially well, um, but I do take adaptogenic herbs, which help counteract stress, modulate your immune system functions. So adaptogenic herbs are really good for just protecting against the, that aging process and keeping us well. Diet, I have three rules that I try to go by our guidelines. Um, I try to eat more vegetables than anything else every day. Not in a plate of potatoes. You know, that's, that's broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and all the good stuff. I try to eat more fresh food than anything else. I try to minimize the processed food that I eat. And I try not to eat any more calories than I need in a day. But those three guidelines open you up from a, for a lot of possibilities that can be within a healthy diet. I try to walk or do the equivalent of three to four miles every day. I think moving your body is so essential to wellness, but you have to be careful about beating your body up at the same time. And I try to zero my hormones every day, my stress hormones. You know, we all build up stress as we go through the day. And I found that the key to getting a good night's sleep, which is really important, is not being all keyed up during the day. So I'll take a nap, meditate, go for a walk, something that just brings down that collection of stress hormones and normalizes that during the day. And if you can do those things, you'll do wonders for yourself. I would agree with that. Dr. Rawls, thank you so much again for uh, sitting down and sharing some of your vast knowledge about treating chronic Lyme and just Lyme disease and you know mysterious chronic illnesses in general. I think there's just a lot here that most people haven't thought about or been told um, that will really help them to see the situation differently, whether they've interacted in some way with Lyme, or if it's two weeks away from now that they, you know, find a tick or have a situation, um, they'll feel more prepared. So thank Very you good. again. Adrian, thank you for the opportunity. And, um, you know, my next project is I've um, been working on a book for how to age in a healthy fashion. And it looks at that microbe component in the immune system and how herbal therapies and natural therapies fit into that. So hopefully that's going to be coming here in the next six months or so. Great. Well, I know your book, Unlocking Lyme, was great for me to awesome. learn so much. So I think anybody who's interested more in the Lyme topic should, should definitely pick it up and we'll have it on our article. And check out Dr. Rawls at RawlsMD.com is one website. And then uh, yeah, the, the supplements, uh, VitalPlan.com. 
Okay, great. So we'll include both of those on the article version of this. And uh, of course, we'll be excited to see when your next book comes out as well. You'll have to let us know whenever that is. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks again. Take care.